Since 1934, Iowa's farmers have turned to the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman as their trusted news source. Now, the spokesman speaks. Listen in and hear from leading experts on topics important to farmers and agriculture. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our May 28th edition of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and we're giving you this episode a couple of days earlier than usual due to the Memorial Day holiday. I hope you're able to enjoy some extra time with friends and family during the long weekend while honoring the men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. In today's episode, we're bringing you two key players in a new collaborative water quality project that's adding 51 saturated buffers and bioreactors to the central Iowa landscape over the next year. I'm talking about Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Neg and farmer Jacob Hansacker, who also runs the excavating company that's constructing those conservation practices. Since the adoption of Iowa's nutrient reduction strategy back in 2013, we've seen so much good work on conservation practices and partnerships throughout our state, and this Water Quality Blitz initiative represents that next step in our progression. For more on that, we bring on spokesman reporter Tom Block with Iowa's Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Nag. Mike, thanks for joining us. The department has announced a significant new conservation project that's being called the Water Quality Blitz in the Des Moines and Raccoon River watersheds. Can you describe what the project entails? Uh, you bet. And this is uh, exactly the kind of, of project that we hoped that we could see come to fruition with the long-term dedicated funding that we've got now for water quality uh, that came through Senate File 512. And that allows us to think ahead. That allows us to group conservation practices together and build them all at once. And so this is a concept that has been talked about for a couple of years, and that's just the idea of how can we group sites together and deploy one contractor to build multiple sites and, and hopefully gain some efficiencies there. And so that's exactly what has happened here. That makes this unique. But the other thing that makes this project unique is the local partners that are involved. And uh, in this case, Polk County is funding 25% of the construction costs, the state, uh, the Department of Ag funding 75%. And so that makes this a unique project as well. But really, at the end of the day, what this means is we're going to build 51 conservation practices in a targeted area using one contractor and a unique new partnership to get it all done. This is a great start. and I'm really proud of 51 projects uh, being done. But uh, I'll tell you what, what I'm most excited about is what comes next, the next phases of this, these types of projects. And what is the next phase after this? Well, so, uh, you know, 51 are being built uh, in phase one, but I can tell you that, well, the next 100 to 150 sites are being identified in that same geography. And so we hope that uh, next year we could be announcing that phase two approach. And then the other thing that's happening is we've got other communities that are interested in this. This is now a model that can be used. So again, you've got Polk County, you've got Polk and Dallas soil conservation commissioners that are involved. We've got partners, private sector partners as well. This is something that can be modeled and done in other parts of the state as well. So I'm really excited about what this can mean. And we're talking about some targeted practices here, saturated buffers and bioreactors, things like that. Why is cost share important for those kind of edge of field practices? Well, right. You know, the nutrient reduction strategy lays out sort of different groups of, of practices. Um, you know, things like cover crops and, and no-till and fertilizer management, those are things that are management practices. Those are things that farmers can do on their land that affect the crop. It's got an agronomic impact. Those are things that we still cost share on, but we don't pay as much uh, cost share. We don't pay as large a percent of those costs. When you talk about an edge of field practice, something like a bioreactor, a saturated buffer, or a wetland, those are things that are at the edge of the field. They have no they have no benefit to that crop or that land, but they do have a great benefit downstream. And so it makes sense that in those situations where we're building those, again, those edge of field practices, that water quality infrastructure, it would make sense for us to pay a, a higher rate of cost share. And that's the way we've approached this. So those edge of field practices, higher cost share because the, the benefit is accrued downstream. Management practices, we believe that because of soil health benefits and 
maybe even carbon sequestration opportunities that those benefits are accrued to the landowner, to the farmer, or a lot of them are, and there's an impact downstream as well. You mentioned several agencies involved in this, ranging all the way from the federal level down to the county level, farmers and other. What kind of benefit will we see from these public-private partnerships like this? Well, again, you know, when we set out to start implementing the nutrient reduction strategy, we always knew that we were going to have to leverage state dollars with federal dollars and with local dollars and private dollars as well to be able to get the work done, to be able to achieve our aggressive goals on water quality and soil health. And so we've always known that we needed to have great partners. The good news is that we've seen this over many years now uh, develop into a situation where we've got over 350 different partners that are involved in projects all across the state. And those are urban conservation practices and practices on the rural landscape as well. In this case, again, it's it's somewhat unique. You've got Polk County actually stepping in and providing funding for a quarter of the construction cost. Again, it's unique in that uh, we haven't seen that kind of engagement that actually putting dollars into it before. But again, we know that there's a, a model here that can be can be deployed in other places in the state. Now, why would a Polk County want to get involved? Well, they're looking at the benefit, again, downstream, uh, whether it's water quality or uh, for drinking water or uh, recreational opportunities or even flood mitigation. Those are all things that cities and communities downstream can care about. And uh, we've seen Cedar Rapids also uh, be a good partner and, and invest in, in practices upstream. This is something that I believe we can see happen all across the state. And a fairly high profile area here in central Iowa, the most populated region. So this will be a good chance for urban people to see what farmers are doing and investing in. I tell you, I really like that too, that we're still early on in implementation of practices really in the grand scheme of things. And so we still need to make sure we're we're drawing attention to these practices, that we're highlighting these things, that we're showing how practices can be installed together in a coordinated effort. Again, develop the models, prove the concept. And then give folks a chance to see uh, the benefits in a, in a really targeted area. And uh, again, it's exactly what we hoped would happen uh, when we uh, started to see those dollars from Senate File 512 come through. And uh, we're, we're going to continue to scale up from here. Now, it's, I, I should also note that uh, these practices are being installed in, in, in this case in Polk and Dallas counties, which uh, also are the Des Moines and Raccoon River watersheds. Those uh, watersheds are, are important watersheds to us for many reasons. They're two of the targeted watersheds that we've been working in for several years now. And, and uh, that's because, one, we, we know that there's a need to improve water quality, but also there's an opportunity to be successful. This is exactly what we intended to do, which is to target resources, target effort, work with partners, and uh, accelerate the adoption of practices. Now, as you travel the state and visit with farmers, are you seeing increased interest in uh, conservation water quality over the years? Without a doubt. You know, 2020 presented us with so many challenges, uh, and yet I'm really proud of the fact that we set a record in the state of Iowa in terms of conservation adoption last year. And uh, that's because we've never had more resources more awareness, more focus, more effort being put forward on improving water quality and soil health in the state of Iowa than ever before. And that's saying something because the state of Iowa has been a leader all the way back to coming out of the Dust Bowl era, working on soil erosion prevention. We were the first state in the region to finalize and begin implementing our nutrient reduction strategy. We've been a leader. We should be. We're a leader in production. We should also be a leader in, in how we produce. Protecting soil and water is critically important to our, our success today, but also our success into the future. And so uh, it's right that we should be aggressively pursuing these efforts. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just really encouraged by the, uh, the number of folks that are trying new things, that are getting engaged in local watershed projects. We have over 2 million acres of cover crops in the state of Iowa today, which is a great start. We've come a long way in a relatively short time, and, and there's a lot more to do. So uh, I'm really encouraged by what I see. And you know, of course, again, as traveling the state, it's a very diverse state, right? And the same practices won't work up in Northeast Iowa that will work in Central Iowa or Southern Iowa. 
That is so true. Iowa is more diverse than folks uh, maybe give us credit for sometimes, but from border to border and river to river, there are many different landscapes and, and many, many soil types. And so what we'll continue to fight for, what I'll continue to, to, to work towards is, is that as we implement the nutrient reduction strategy, as we even look at, at uh, the opportunity to, uh, uh, for folks to be perhaps paid for carbon sequestration, as we look at continuing to work on preventing soil erosion, that we will always fight for uh, offering a menu of, of options, a, a menu of conservation practices that work. Every operation is different. The landscape is different. Uh, far be it from me to sit in Des Moines or, or, or somebody in Washington, D.C. to tell us what works on a farm somewhere in the state of Iowa or, or in the country. It, it just We want conservation practices to last, to stand the test of time. We want to build a culture of conservation, not a culture of regulation. And, uh, and so I think that's really important. And, and again, that's, that's the, why we've crafted and structured the, uh, our efforts around targeted watersheds that are projects that are locally led, because folks who, uh, who are, when, th when those are locally led, uh, they will address the issues that are most relevant and pursue the practices that are most fitting for the landscape. I like to call it, it's tailor-made conservation. And uh, there's, a, there's a local nature to that. And, and we have to respect the diversity of our, of our landscape uh, when, when we're pursuing these efforts. Absolutely. And if farmers are interested in projects like announced during this water quality blitz, you said, you know, it'll be replicated across the state. How can they get involved, whether it's in, you know, these targeted watersheds or other parts of the state? I tell you, there's, there's a lot of ways to get involved for, for just general information about conservation practices and water quality. Cleanwateriowa.org is a great website that gives some high level information. But, you know, the best way. For a, especially for a farmer or landowner who's interested in conservation adoption or this particular type of effort around uh, saturated buffers and bioreactors, the best thing you can do is to contact your local uh, county conservation office, uh, uh, pick up the phone, knock on the door, uh, and really, regardless of what logo uh, the person's wearing on the other end of the phone or, or across the counter, whether it's USDA, Iowa Department of Ag, or the local soil and water conservation district staff, Somebody can help you. They can get you pointed in the right direction and, and connect the dots for you. Uh, if you would reach out to that county conservation office, that's the best way, the quickest way for us to uh, to start down the path of, uh, of working towards getting a practice on the ground. Very good, Mike. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing what's next. Well, I tell you, I'm really excited about the progress. We're accelerating the adoption. We set a record last year. I, I'm, I'm pushing our team and I fully expect that we'll set another record this coming year and, uh, and, and hopefully records uh, beyond that as well. Thank you. That's a whole lot of conservation progress in a short period of time, and you have to appreciate the collaboration and planning that are making it happen. With a project this big, we know that many of you are probably thinking, who's going to build all of those conservation structures? For that, we bring in the man with the excavator. Jacob Hansacker is a farmer and Farm Bureau leader from Hardin County, and he also runs the excavating business that earned the opportunity to build the bioreactors and saturated buffers for this Blitz initiative. So let's hand it back to Tom Block with Jacob Hansacker. Jacob, thanks for joining us today. You wear a couple different hats as a farmer and owner of a business that does a lot of tiling and earthwork for farmers, among other customers. Give us a little background on those enterprises and how they complement each other. You bet, Tom. Well, thanks for having me on here. I'm part of a fifth generation family farm up in Radcliffe, Iowa here. And along with two brothers and my dad, we farm corn and soybeans and pigs. So that's one of our entities. And then about 10 years ago, my brothers and, and a cousin at the time, and we started the excavating. We just wanted to branch out a little bit and, and saw a need in our community and, and for ourselves also. We never really planned on to be where we're at today by, by any means. We just were looking to do a little bit of stuff here and there, mainly some tiling on our own projects and got involved and, and we've grown it from there. So it's been a 
a steady climb and we're still in that climbing growth phase on the excavating and farm side and so it's it's kind of nice uh, between the brothers and I and and dad we all kind of have our our own little niches that we kind of specialize in but we're able to provide assistance and knowledge on on any of the other aspects now it was announced recently you're going to be working on a major water quality project putting in conservation structures on farms here in central Iowa what kind of work are you going to be doing as part of this project? This project is a few different aspects. So it's uh, saturated buffers and bioreactors are the main components of this project. And, and we've had quite a bit of success and history with these in the past several years, uh, working with Iowa State and, and also Polk County and Story County and different watersheds around the central Iowa region that we've been able to work with them on in, installing these saturated buffers and bioreactors. So we have, we have good experience and, and this project came up and something to bid on and a uh, great opportunity to, to package a lot of these different things together and, and work with a lot of different landowners who are interested in, in processes like this. Yeah. You've mentioned that you, you've worked on some of these with Iowa state and other entities. Have you gotten any feedback on how they're working and improving water quality? From everything I hear, they're working great. We're 50% or higher of nitrate reduction coming through these saturated buffers and bioreactors. And they're we're treating a lot of acres with the ones we've already put in. And we'll treat a lot more by the end of the end of the summer here. Have you seen farmers really eager to adopt these? And what are the major concerns that they might have or hurdles that they have to overcome when they're going to be starting construction on a buffer or a bioreactor? Well, at the at the end of the day, the biggest hurdle to overcome for a farmer or a landowner is that it is an investment without a monetary return. So there's no monetary or very little monetary investment on most of these practices. The working with our partners at IDOLS and NRCS, we're able to get a lot of these practices close to 100% cost share. So there's no out-of-pocket expense, but there is some ground that has to be set aside for these practices, whether it's a stream bank area for a saturated buffer or an area for the bioreactor, but it, it does take a little, little acres out of production if it's inside the field area. Oftentimes, these are located in existing buffers, so there's nothing cropland taken out of, of the process or the farmer's acres. But the, the biggest thing is the wait time. Farmers aren't a group that really like to uh, sit around and wait, especially if they're sitting around and waiting on the government. And in the past, some of these processes have taken a, a long time to work through. Kudos to the NRCS and the IDOLS folks and, and everybody else that are behind the scenes and designing these. I do believe that these processes are getting better and the turnaround time is getting a lot better for these. You know, processes like what we're doing in Polk County here, that's going to be an exciting first step to see how uh, multiple processes work and get them get them bundled together and have the farmer approached by the conservation groups rather than the than the other way around, the farmer approaching the conservation groups knowing that these processes will work. And talking to the farmer, I think, will, will help open the eyes a little bit and say, hey, maybe I can work these into my farm. When you're designing a, a project or going out to a farm to see what they might need, whether it's a saturated buffer or a bioreactor or something else, what are the kind of things that you look for and how do they change? I imagine every farm has to be a unique in, in how these things are going to be set up. It is. And to be honest with you, that question's a little above my pay grade. I don't work in the design aspect of, of these. That's some water quality engineers with uh, IDOLS and, and the NRCS. They have their engineers. But, but what they look for from my aspect of point is it has to have good tile flow and good water flow coming into the structure. It has to be draining a certain amount of acres to make it viable for some structures like this. Uh, we want to be able to implement these and have the cost of these go to treating the most amount of water and drainage flow that we can. And they're getting better all the time. They're 
some of these processes or some of the bioreactors that we're doing on this Polk County project are larger than what we've done in the past. Some of them that are a little bit new design from what I've seen with some more engineering and, and it looks like it's going to be able to treat some more acres than some of these in the, in the past that we've worked with. I think something that is interesting or, or hasn't been talked about a lot, and I think it's for the expansion of these, I think it's really important, is the fact that all of these structures are going on existing systems. A lot of times folks think that, well, I'm not putting a new drainage system in, so I can't design a water quality structure, bioreactor, saturated buffer, wetland, whatever, because I'm not putting a new system in. Every one of these that we're doing here is a system that, while it might be recent, I don't know that, but I haven't personally put any of these systems in. We're coming in after that drainage has been done onto, some of these are clay lines, some of these are plastic. There's opportunities for all the outlets that are out there to have something done. It doesn't have to be a, a new system freshly designed. On the flip side of that, if someone is, you know, we've worked with NRCS and to design new systems that meet your requirements and then everything's new and it just works seamlessly into the, into the whole project. What kind of maintenance is needed once a project like this is put in? Um, whether it be, I know for the bioreactors, things maybe have to be done every so often period of years. So on the bioreactors, there's kind of a time frame. You know, right now they're thinking it's a 10 to 15 year time frame that the chips will need to be replaced, the wood chips. There's no exact science on that yet. There's not a, at 12 and a half years, we've got to replace this. There's nothing like that with that yet. And on the saturated buffers, it's just something that's going to work. Uh, I haven't heard of any upkeep that's needed to be done with saturated buffers uh, it's the desire is to manage it and get the correct water flow, especially through a bioreactor to keep the nitrates moving how they need to and the water flow going. And, and then there's always the option that this system can work however the farmer wants it. It can drain as quickly or as slowly as, as the farmer wants to work with it. Yeah, I think that's an important point. When you put the saturated buffer in, it's not going to slow that tile drainage down or you know cause a backup or soggy conditions in the field. Correct. Yes, they're designed to, once it gets to that certain point, if we are at a high flow situation, it will it will bypass that bioreactor or saturated buffer, and that excess water will free flow into the outlet. It's not going to cause adverse reaction into the field. Yeah, and certainly working on some key watersheds in here in, in Polk and Dallas counties. How do you think the Private public partnership, you talked about that a little bit and working with the NRCS and farmers. How will that ease the concerns of landowners and help accelerate the adoption of future water quality projects? Well, I think having a ready made opportunity handed to somebody goes a long ways to when I walk up to a, a potential customer with a tiling project, I like to have as many questions as I can have answered that I can predict ahead of time. That's a lot of what they're doing with this public-private partnership. The NRCS and the IDOLs and the Polk County crew is identifying these, doing some work on the front end, then approaching the landowner and saying, hey, th we think this might work for you. And it's been great since that Water Quality Wednesday that we kicked this off. I've had several people contact me and wonder how they can get in touch with the right people. And I think it's going to be sparking that interest of, on one side, bringing a ready-made project to a landowner and saying this can be done, or can we field verify this because we think it can be done, rather than, hey, is there somewhere we can go out and look around, having a plan in place ahead of time, coupling that with the opportunity that, hey, this is, this is going on, this is an opportunity that will kind of spur those folks along that are thinking about it, but they don't really know where to start. Getting the word out there that they can contact their local NRCS agent, they can talk, contact Polk County, um, they can contact me. Um, there, there's lots of different contacts and, and these things are really ramping up and these opportunities are available for anybody out there that 
that wants one. So we, we often say that there's no silver bullet in water quality, but there's a lot of different opportunities and, and something is going to fit. Uh, if someone has the desire to, to work with a process, something will likely work. It might not be exactly what they had originally planned on, but something in the toolkit can can make a difference. This project will keep you busy, obviously. I think over a year's worth of projects here, uh, 51 and all, but is it something that could be repeatable then in other watersheds here across the state? Absolutely. Uh, as they announced on the kickoff time frame, oh, there's 51 here This on this grouping, and they have another grouping that they're putting together that I believe they said is over 100 now. So I think they're really gaining traction and they're getting getting people involved and and we'll uh, we're going to knock these out as quick as we can and see see how we can uh, keep going with the rest of them. And finally, just to wrap up, as a farmer, what do you hear from your peers on wanting to get these type of practices and, and do everything they can to improve water quality? Well, I think a lot of the conversation goes around the process now is available and it's voluntary and we need to take advantage of these voluntary options that we can can make happen and make work and and work along with our partners on the on the other side, the government side and the the associational side versus getting to the point where it's mandatory and and it has to be done. So we're we're working hard. We've made great progress so far on our water quality strategy and our goals. And and this project and many others like it will keep us keep us farming autonomously and making our own decisions, but making uh, good decisions and, and moving things forward. And there you go. For years, we've been telling folks about the enthusiasm farmers have for ramping up their conservation efforts. And you're seeing that again with this new water quality blitz project. Thanks to Jacob and Secretary Neg for joining us on the podcast. And thank you to all of our listeners who are actively involved in making conservation and water quality progress happen across the state. You're the ones turning the talk into action, and we're proud to shine a light on those efforts. You can learn more about this Central Iowa Blitz Initiative and other successful conservation initiatives around the state at conservationcountsiowa.com. Okay, we're near the end of this podcast episode, but before you go, I need to tell you about two upcoming opportunities. The first is a webinar series for livestock farmers who want to learn about their latest risk management options. Those options have improved over the past year, so if you're a livestock farmer and you're not familiar with your latest options, you'll want to check out that webinar series, which takes place June 9th and 16th. We've included a link in the notes for this podcast episode, so you can learn more there and get registered. The second opportunity is a chance to learn about the private sector carbon credit markets that are available to farmers. What are the benefits? What are the costs and commitments? Are these private sector markets a good fit for your farm? On July 14th, Iowa Farm Bureau is hosting a virtual roundtable to help you answer those questions and more. It's called Carbon Credit Markets, What Farmers Need to Know, and we'll be releasing more details on it over the next few days, so stay tuned to iowafarmbureau.com. We'll also be giving you a primer for the virtual roundtable in our next episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and look for the next episode on June 14th. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau. And thanks for listening to the Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to the Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to the Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.